this morning time for short times meditation i would like to draw your attention to a subject that uh, i want to speak on and the subject would be security of the believers and insecurity of non believers security of believers and insecurity of non believers before getting into that subject i want you to remind you that you know there is a biography of you and me written in the bible how many of you believe that that's what we are going to see this morning time my biography is written by god your biography is written by god aren't you excited to read your biography my biography not someone not my wife my children writing it my biography written by god himself and your biography written by god himself yes we should be excited about that so for that we will turn to a very small psalm that is psalm number 1 i know we have meditated many a times this psalm but my prayer would be that god may teach us his ways this morning time there are only six verses in this psalm and we would read it together verse number 1 through 6 of psalm number 1 blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of scornful verse 2 but his delight is in the law of the lord and in his law that he meditate day and night verse 3 and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season he leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper verse 4 the ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous verse 6 for the lord knoweth the way of the righteous but the way of the ungodly shall perish very beautiful sam very meaningful sam most of us uh, have learned it by heart so we know this sam when we study this sam you can divide it in this sam into three parts verse number 1 2 and 3 would be one division verse number 4 and 5 would be the second division and verse number 6 would be the third division so we are going to break it and we are going to learn it so three divisions uh, of chapter 1 but before getting into psalms chapter number 1 i want to give you a background of this book psalm number 1 even though we find it the first psalm in the bible but it is not the first psalm which is the first psalm in the bible if somebody asks you you should be able to answer i am not going to question you but i will give you the answer i don't want to put you in an awkward situation psalm number 90 the only psalm written by moses is the first psalm that was written psalm number 1 in the original hebrew you don't find it but it was put down through the inspiration of the holy spirit by the compilers in the beginning with a purpose i will show you what is the purpose of writing it down so here is sam number 1 so sam number 90 was written 400 years before sam number 1 400 years before sam number 1 was written sam number 90 the only sam that is written by moses so then the other question would be which is the last sam there are 150 sams in the book of sam so 150 is not the last sam so then the question is which is the last sam sam number 126 is the last sam that was written sam number 1 is years 400 years before is sam number 90 600 years after sam number 1 is sam number 126 written so it took almost 1000 years for the compilers to compose this book almost 1000 year you got the background so sam number 1 and sam number 2 they are pairs if you if you look at the verse number 1 of sam number 1 how does it start blessed is the man when you come to sam number 2 and verse number 2 12 the last verse it it reflects the same same concept over there it says 
in the last portion blessed are they that put their trust in him that is what in psalm number one verse one that was the thought now as i mentioned psalm number 90 the heading very clearly says the psalm of moses or prayer of moses but psalm number one you don't see the heading in psalm number two also you don't see the heading but one thing we should understand that most of the psalms are written by david and most scholars believe that this psalm was written by david but you don't just have to believe what i say but we have to dive into the scriptures to find out if this is really true or false so for that when you come to the book of acts chapter 4 and verse number 24 through 28 it very clearly talks about this thought that you read in psalm number 2 let me remind, let me turn that portion or you can join with me acts chapter 4 acts chapter 4 and verse number, let's read Acts chapter 4, verse number uh, 25 onwards. Who by thy mouth of thy servant David. So in the book of Acts, the author of Sam is mentioned. Right? So you don't have to believe me. It says, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against Christ. That is the thought, right? Now let us come back to Psalm number 2. When you come to Psalm number 2 and verse number 1 and 2, just read. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Do you get the thought process now? So now I believe that you can agree with me that Psalm number 2 was written by David. That is the quotation that is being put in Acts number 4. Acts, number, uh, Acts 4. So if Psalm number 2 is written by David and that is the same thought in Psalm number 1. It's basically one Psalm. Psalm number 1 and 2 it's a continuation. So even though the heading does not give us who the author is but we can relate to the quote from Acts chapter 4 and we don't have to fight about the authorship you can just say no we it does not matter but what I'm trying to say I'm just trying to let you know scholars believe the author is David and that is the proof that the the quotation from Sam in the book of Acts now let us come to this book there are various deep insights in this book that can touch our heart change our heart so my question to each one of us this morning time would be the question that I have to ask myself and you have to ask yourself whose side you belong to in which side are you because there are two groups of people mentioned in the book of Sam number one very simple Sam with a very deep insight there are two groups mentioned one is a blessed man and the other is a cursed man you know we all all want to be happy right but when we are in this world you talk to people everyone is so depressed everyone is so sad because everyone is going through some or the other problem if somebody says I don't have any problem in my life he's a liar Either you are going through sickness, either you are going through problems in your work, in your family, with your children, or the children in the college or in your church. Everyone who is alive has some or the other issues. If you talk to my mom, she, she has a list of all those problems, right? That's why Psalm number 90 reminds us, you know, our life on this earth is 70 years or 80 years. But if you continue, it's sorrow, pain. You know, why do you want to live in this world? If you, but if you are prepared to face that challenge, okay, just pray to God that give, God may give you a life of 120 years, right? So that is not the point. Everyone has some or the other problem. But the psalmist is reminding us that if you belong to the Lord, you should be a happy man. And if you are not happy, then there is something wrong. It's not the happiness that world can give you. It is not the happiness that my wife can give me, my family can give me, or your workers can give you. The happiness can only come from the Lord. And here the concept of that happiness, that is what blessed is, happiness. 
Now, when you talk to people, they for to find joy, peace, and happiness. I'm not talking about this joy. Okay, so joy, peace, and happiness. People travel so far, spend so much of money to find peace, joy, and happiness. But my dear brothers and sisters, our happiness is in this Bible. Especially when you read Sam. You know, there are, the book of Psalms is so beautiful. For the past six months, I have not preached apart from Psalms. I started studying Psalms. Preachers don't preach on Psalms. If you, if you listen to all the preaching you had in your church, everybody is preaching from the epistles, right? From Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, and from the gospel. Nobody wants to preach from Psalms. But I studied the Psalm and sat down and I have been preaching. And it's so beautiful when you sit down and study this book of Psalms. If you read the book of Psalms, there are five books. There's not a Bible study, but just giving you a background. There are five books composed in this. Book number one, book number two, book number three, book number four, book number four, and various chapters under that. Why is Psalm number one presented in the first place? Because if you read the book number five or the volume five of book Psalm, you see at the end of the Psalms, what do you? what is the thought in those chapters? Sometimes you may have questioned that, God did not have anything else to speak because they, you don't find material in that. Every verse, what does it say? Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, bless the Lord, praise the Lord, bless the Lord. Let the king say, praise the Lord. Let the people say, bless the Lord. That is what you, at the end of the psalm. Have you ever thought why? But when you read psalm number one, you didn't find that thought process. Because this book of psalm is a poetry, it's a Hebrew poetry. There are books, in the book of Sam, you will see the heading, a song of ascent. Have you ever thought what is that song of ascent means? It means you are climbing on the top and the people used to go climb to the top mountain tops and when they were climbing those mountain tops, they were singing this song. So this Sam number one is like, you know, it's just the doorpost. So people are entering into the temple and how to worship the Lord. So the later portions, the volume book number five is basically the climax of worship. Therefore, we don't have anything to talk about. That's what we read in the book of Isaiah, right? When Isaiah saw the glory of God, the temple filling the the temple filled with the glory of God, what did he say? Holy, 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 and the angels, what are they saying? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of nothing else. In the same way, the end of Psalms, when you come, it's praise the Lord, praise the Lord, bless the Lord, praise the Lord, bless the Lord. That is the climax of worship. So when we come to worship, it is nothing about you and me. It's nothing preaching over there. You don't have to um, exhort a lot of um, uh, scripture portion. We have carried on that tradition in our brethren assemblies during worship time. It's not giving glory to him. It, it has become a preaching time. I am preaching now. But during our worship also, it has become a preaching time. People stand there for preaching for 15 to 20 minutes. That is not a time of preaching. That is not a time bringing epistles. Epistles are the doctrine to the church. But worship time is only glory to him. Sam is theocentric. If you look at the Sam, if you read Sam, all the Sam, most of the Sams are theocentric. Theocentric means only about God. Thy, thou. When the author talks about, when David talks about, he does not talk about himself. He talks about Lord, thou art, thine, you are great. Everything focusing to God. But we sometimes forget and we have just become, we, are, we, we don't even understand what we are during the time of worship. It's not about you and me. It's not about Paul or Peter. It's giving him glory. So our exhortation, the word that itself that we use, I believe, I don't agree to that. Therefore, I don't stand for exhortation. I praise. I don't stand for exhortation because it's not a time of preaching. The actual word should be exaltation. When you come to worship God, it is exaltation. I don't have to exhort you to worship. If I am the one who is exhorting you to worship, then there's something wrong. Because Jesus not only died for me, Jesus died for you also. So I don't have to stand on your behalf. If I can say, I love you, Lord, you have to say, Lord, I love you. So I cannot exhort you. So when we come to worship, it is not a place to prepare the food at that time. It's like recipe, giving the recipe during worship time. 
the recipe should be given before you come to worship when we come to worship we should come just like mary bringing the uh, spike knot and opening the bottle and pouring it on the foot of, feet of jesus it's a time it's not a time of preparation preparation should have started long back so what we do we come in the worship time and we give the recipe do like this do like this do like this and then one person stands and prays for the bread so where you did not give me the time to prepare the bread when i come to worship i should come with the prepared bread prepared ointment and pour it so if this is not the time of preparation preparation should start the moment you leave this place so next week when you come to worship you come with a prepared heart with your prepared ointment and you just pour it during the time of worship you open the bottle and just pour it that is not the time to bring all the recipes together but what are we? just think on that i am not criticizing any you just sit down and think aren't we all doing this so we should have more praises less exhortation but the opposite is happening people stand up and find out themselves to just start preaching it's not a time of preaching because when you do that all glory goes to you when i stand now when i am standing and preaching you all are looking at me when somebody stands for exhort everybody is focused on him and then after the worship they will say wow it was a very beautiful thought so you took the glory from god so it should be more of praising more of praising because when you are praising what do you say lord i love you lord i thank you nothing else but when you are exhorting you are saying peter told that paul told that so we should do that no i don't have to teach you that is not a time of teaching so that's not my subject so here also when david writes the psalm he is telling that blessed is the man now spurgeon says a very very important thought that you have to understand he is talking about the man the author is not talking about blessed is the king blessed is david no he is saying blessed is the man you and me how can you be blessed how can you be happy we have to understand if you are a child of god you have to be happy it is not that when there are good times you become happy and when bad time comes in your life you murmur you grumble if you are a child of god if you are a blessed man you have to be happy in all season not only when you get gift from god when you are doing good you are happy when difficulty comes in your way that is the sign of a good believer that is the sign of a blessed man even if you are going through trials look at the life of job it was not only in his happy time but in his bad time also he praised god so if we are a child of god if you are a child of god whether it is good time or bad time you have to be happy so when we come to assembly when we come for prayer meeting we should not have a gloomy face because we are happy in the lord so this happiness comes from the lord lord is the one who gives us happiness it's not by our effort by our merit whatever we do god gives us the strength to endure this all challenges in our life so the happiness is the right of a believer are you proud of that it is the right of a believer you have to be happy but you are not happy because you are not trusting you are not putting your faith in lord jesus christ because in the book of romans it says if god be for us who can be against us if god be for you why do you worry no one can touch you anything no one can do anything to you but you have to put that trust in him so if you are if you are a blessed man you should be a happy man that is the first thought that the author brings over here now there are three things and in this there are three things that the author points in verse number 1 he says this blessed man three things and it starts with three negative but you have to understand this is hebrew poetry if there are three negative there should be three positive that's how the poetry goes on so he says the blessed man does not do three things what are the three things i want you to look into that the first thing is walk second thing is stand and the third thing is sit so a blessed man does not walk a blessed man does not stand a blessed man does not sit that is the first three then the second three in the same verse that man what blessed man walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly standeth in the way of sinners sitteth in the seat of scornful now this walk what does the walk means 
In Amos chapter 3 and verse number 3, what does it say? There is a verse that very clearly focuses on this walk. Can two walk together unless they are in agreement to each other? So you can only walk with someone if you are agreeing to each other. It's not like in a Malayali couples, right? The husband will walk far and the wife will be left behind, right? So you are not in unity with each other. So if, you're, if your wife is slow, you have to slow down, hold on to your hand, put your hand on the shoulders and walk. But we are so shy to do that, right? So when you are in unity, unity with each other, you are walking together. So here it says, a blessed man walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So if you are walking with ungodly, that means that you are in alignment, you are in agreement to that person. You are saying that you don't believe in him, but then how can you walk with him? Only two can walk when they are in agreement with each other. If you are not in agreement with each other, you cannot walk together. Then you may have a question, if that is the case, we are in the world. So are you talking to me or are you telling me that we should not associate with non-believers? No, I did not say that. Because Jesus is the one who said, go to the highways and byways and preach the gospel. In the highways and the byways, who are there? It is all the ungodly people. It's all the wicked people. So what does this mean? So Jesus is not telling you and me to be isolated from the world, but he is telling you and me to be insulated in the world. You don't have to isolate yourself. You have to insulate. It is just like the boat on the water. What happens if the water gets inside the boat? We all are like the boat and the world is the water. We have to be in the water. But the water should not get inside you and me. The moment the water gets inside you and me, you are going to drown. So you should not isolate yourself. You should insulate yourself. So that is what the author is saying. You should not walk. Then what does it say? Nor standeth in the way of sinners. What does that mean? Standing in the way of sinners. That means, are you thinking that you stand and block him? No. Standing, the stand, standing means you are supporting someone. You know, when there is a vote or something in our schools also in young days. Okay, those who agree to that all stand up, say yeah, right? So when you are standing, you are, you are saying you are supporting that. So here also when you are standing, you are supporting. If you don't agree to that, you just leave that place. But if you are standing there, you are a part of that. You know that even if you did not commit any crime, but you are standing there and witnessing that you are a part of that crime. You are equally liable for that crime. That's the same concept. You are supporting. So the scripture is saying you not only walk, you cannot even stand. And the third point it says, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Sitting means, what does sitting mean? You are participating. It's like doing business. You know, when, when, there is, when the two parties are there, they are talking. And they're walking and talking, walking and talking. That is agreement. Once they agree, what do they do? They sit down. Right? So now they agree to what they say. And now what they do? During the sitting down is the signing of the document. Participation in that. So a blessed man does not do these three things. A blessed man does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scornful. Let's come to verse number four, uh, two. <laughs> but... Now, but is a very dangerous word, right? So don't, not that, but, okay? So there is a connection. The first verse, it says, you don't do this thing. Don't do this. Don't do this. Now he says, but his, whose? Again, it is related to words number one. The blessed man, his delight, his delight. Where do you delight? Where is your delight? Is your delight on the iPad? Is your delight on your iPhone 14? Is your delight on your TV? Is your delight in your house, in your car? Where is your delight? Or is de your delight in the food that you eat? Here he says, the writer says, his delight means a blessed man's delight is in the law of the Lord. So where, how, where do you delight? How do you delight yourself? In Psalm number 40 that we read, when Jesus is saying, I delight to do thy will, O God, my Father. 
delight in Jesus Christ, delight. He says, I delight to do thy will, O God. When Jesus was dying on the cross, it was the delight of Jesus Christ to obey his father. Are you delighted to come to worship? When we come to worship, are we delighted to come and worship? Are you delighted to read the scriptures? Or are you sleeping when I am talking? If you are delighted, you can listen to the sermon hours and hours and hours and hours. I do that. I have no other job. But I am not. I don't have a secular job, so I have so much of time. I am not talking about you. I am talking of me. Hours and hours and hours I do that. So where is your delight? If you are a child of God, if you are a blessed man, your delight should be in the word of God. Your delight should be in listening to the word of God. Your delight should be in praying. Your delight should be in diving into the word of God. Then it says, in the law of the Lord. For them it was Torah. In the old covenant it was Torah. But for us, what is it? It is the Bible. And that is what the concept that you see in the book of Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 8. Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 8. That is a promise given to you and me. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate. Again, the same concept. When should you meditate? Day and night thou mayest observe to do according to this written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Thou shalt have good success. My dear brothers and sisters, you may have a question. I am not successful. I am failing. I am not doing good. Why? The answer is there. You are not delighting in the word of God. Because the promise that God has given to you and me, if you delight in me, if you delight in the word of God, it very clearly says you will be prosperous. I am not preaching prosperity gospel. You will be prosperous. That is what God said, Yahweh said. And you shall have good success. Is God lying to you? Here it says, same thought, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, doth he meditate day and night. Same thing was there, right? Meditating day and night means it's not that 24-7 you sit down with the word of God. No, it does not mean that. Whenever you get time, that's the concept over there. You are driving, you are praying to God, you are working, you are praying to God. It's not that 24-7 go on reading and praying, not like the Pharisees who prayed, like lengthy prayers. It can be a short prayer. God knows your heart. Right? And what does this meditate mean? The actual Hebrew word of this meditate is yege. Yege means what? It's like chewing the curd. Chewing the curd. Have you ever seen a cow? You know, cow will sit there and what is the cow doing? Like our kids in the church, when they sit down, they do something, right? This is yege. Go on chewing, go on chewing, go on chewing. Till the last juice, that's what the cows do. They go to the field, they take all the grass and whatever they find out, they take it. Do they eat all that? No. They are just taking it, taking it, putting in their tummy because the tummy is so big, right? All this cut, all the grass is there. Now they come down, they settle down. And when they settle down, they are chewing. And the last drop of juice, they get it. Now what? They, now they will take the other one. Now it will come up. They again start chewing. That is what is meditation. Sit down. Meditate on that word. That is the thought of meditation. Take the last juice. The, because the word of God is so powerful. It's a double-edged sword that pierces your heart and soul. You die more and more, more and more. You have heard this message, right? Many a time. But again and again, you, you see new thoughts coming to your mind. Because this is what is meditation. He meditates day and night. Verse number 3. And he shall be again. He who is this person? He is the blessed man. We are talking of the first group of people. The blessed man will be like. You are not a tree. You will be like a tree. Have you ever seen a tree? The tree is very strong. Very big. It is prosperous. Green. Their fruit. You will be like that tree. That is powerful. That is, that is green. There is prosperity in you. As a child of God, as a believer, as a blessed man, you should not lack anything. Joy, peace and happiness all belongs to you. That is what the scripture says. You are like the tree. Look at that tree. It is so powerful. It is so magnificent. It is so green. 
there are so many fruits it's always green your life should be also like that like a tree then it says you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water oh what a blessed thought it is where are you you are not in a barren land you are planted by the riverside again you have to look at the scriptures it's not saying that you are planted like a seed you are like a tree planted by the riverside what does that mean that means you were somewhere else from there you are plucked and you are brought to the riverside me you you all were in that barren land you were in that wilderness you were in that desert but jesus christ came and he plucked you and me there was a transplant done of our heart a surgery was done in our heart from that barren land from that desert we were uprooted and we were planted by the riverside what a great thought it is have you ever thought of it we were in that barren land we were in that desert we were dry the tree had no leaf the tree had no fruit but jesus christ plucked you and me from that barren land by giving his life on that cross and he has planted you by the riverside and what does it say that bringeth forth his fruit in his season it's not like we are in the barren land we are planted by the not the river does it say river it says rivers it's in plural there is no scarcity of water what is water the word of god is water in the tabernacle if you see there was a laver there was water in that laver and this water is the word of god because in the old covenant the priest had to wash their feet wash themselves to sanctify themselves how do we wash not with this water but we wash ourselves with the word of god that is the water you wash yourself with the water now we are planted and the rivers of water the word of god is there that strengthens you and me whatever waves come we are not going to fall down then it says leaf shall not wither your leaf shall not wither are you dry when you are planted by the river side how can your leaves wither if jesus is your lord that's what i said the security that you have eternal security of a believer and the my time is done so i will conclude i don't have time for the second part but it says and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper whatsoever praise god not one thing whatsoever means what anything that you desire that doesn't mean that oh you pray to god to have oh, okay you are working you have you oh god give me a mercedes car that does not mean that the will of god the father whatever you desire it belongs to you because you are a blessed man what a great thought it is verse number 4 and 5 is the opposite of this person that is a wicked man but when you come to words i don't have time for verse 4 and 5 you can just reverse that but when you come to word 6 that is a beautiful part for the lord knoweth the way of the righteous but the way of ungodly shall perish Lord knoweth the way of righteous we are a blessed man and God knows my ways God knows your ways where are our ways it's going up to eternity and the lord says the way of ungodly the wicked man shall perish the wicked man he is going to perish my dear brothers and sisters we saw two groups of people this morning time we saw two ways the blessed man and the wicked man the blessed man's way is righteous way of righteousness the wicked man's way is way of perishing where do you stand which way you want to choose there are only two groups of people in this world there are only two groups of people in this assembly there are only two groups of people in your family there are only two groups of people in your workplace no third group you cannot make a third group only two groups of people either you are a blessed man or you are a wicked man if you are a child of god you are a blessed man if you don't believe in god you are a wicked man as simple as this but one day you are going to die if you are a blessed man the lord knows the way of the righteous you have eternity If you are a wicked man if you have not trusted your faith in Jesus Christ if you have not put faith in Jesus Christ you are going to hell you are going to perish because in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse number 11 it very clearly says God has set eternity in the hearts of men 
Whether you are a believer or a non-believer, eternity belongs to you. If you look at that word, it says, man. It's not only for believers, but if you are a child of God, if you are a believer, eternity, you get eternal heaven. But if you are not a child of God, still eternity belongs to you. You have an eternal hell. Where do you want to, which way you want to choose? The blessed man or the wicked man? The righteous man or the unrighteous man? The blessed man beareth fruit. Un uh, the wicked man are like chaff that will be burned. The choice is yours. Where do you want to spend eternity? Eternity belongs to you. If you have accepted Jesus, you have eternal heaven. But if you have not accepted Jesus, you have eternal hell. Choice is yours. I would ask Nancy to come and sing that song. Thank you.
ീർത്തോരു സ്നേഹം മറക്കാവതോ 